Shalom. 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 All right, welcome to another video. And as always, before we get started, we want to give our praise, our honor, and our glory unto Yahweh Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham Rekakwadash, and double honors to the head apostles slash elder bishops of the great millstone who teach and who rule well. Peace, blessings, and safety to all you sincere Akim. Keep pushing, keep believing, and keep the faith, regardless of whether people hear or whether they forbear. And the title of this lesson is going to be Medieval Architecture slash Castles, etc. were built by Jacob slash History and Prophecy. All right. And the uh, the inspiration for this lesson came from a time we were in a, we were taking a road trip, or going up to Albuquerque to preach, and we thought about how Jacob uh, had ruled over what's known of today as Europe for a period of about 700 years during what's known of as the Dark Ages. All right. So. Essentially, a lot of the the uh, culture and and architecture, the castles, etc., are right, these things were actually created by Jacob. Okay, so we're going to go into that history briefly, and then the second part of the video will be going into prophecy about uh, what the kingdom of heaven will be like on the earth. Okay, so with that being said, Lord's will is edifying to the elect. All right, if you could, brother, get me Revelation 20. Okay, um, so like I said, there was a time period where the Western Roman Empire had fallen for a thousand years, and 700 of those, of those years were ruled over, uh, that, that area was ruled over by Jacob, by the Israelites. Okay, so if you could, brother, start off Revelation 20, start at verse 1. Now this is Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. Yep, yep. so that's talk, that angel's talking about Yahweh Shai. Right. All right, and that bottomless pit. It's talking about Europe. Okay, when you go into uh, Second Ezra, the fifth chapter, okay, it tells you that that pits are likened unto land masses. All right, so keep reading. Yep, it says uh, Revelation 22, and he laid hold on a dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Right, and that's talking about Esau. All right, he is that old serpent, the same serpent that was in the garden, the wicked man that had deceived Eve. All right, so he bound him a thousand years. What does that mean? That means that his influence, his power, his rulership had fallen for a thousand years. All right. And at that time, his rulership was the Roman Empire. OK, today it's the modern day Roman Empire, the beast system, right, which is America, NATO and the EU. OK, but when they had fallen, you had a group of people okay, that had taken over the area that were known of as the Moors. All right. And that's what we're going to read about. OK, so I have this article pulled up. All right. It's from Chattanooga, Chattanooga. News Chronicle, okay, and it's entitled, it says, it says, so-called black kings and queens ruled Europe for almost 700 years, all right, now, it says, history confirms that the Moors ruled in Europe, primarily Spain and Portugal, for almost 700 years, they were known for their influence in European culture, but not many people know that the Moors were actually Europeans of African descent, Moors were usually depicted as being mostly black or very swarthy, and hence the word is also used, often used for Negro, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. And actually, uh, if, if you know different languages, all right, in Spanish, uh, one of the words for, for, uh, for, for darker people is moreno. Okay? That's where that word comes from. Okay? It says, um, next, next paragraph, several written works at the time also confirmed that, the 16th century English playwrights William Shakespeare used the word more as a synonym for African and Christopher Marlowe used more and African interchangeably. All right. Now, we know that that the Israelites are not, um, you know, not actually African like they're not Hamites. All right. But the, that's that's one of the uh, dece deceptions of Esau. OK, but nevertheless, a lot of times when they're talking about, quote unquote, Africans, African-Americans, they're talking about so-called Negroes. Okay, so he's showing he, you know, he's showing you that once again that that word more was used interchangeably with so-called Negroes. Now it says Arthur and historian Chancellor Williams said the original Moors, like the original Egyptians, were Black Africans. Okay, so and this information has been hidden. All right, Esau has uh, done what's called historicide, pretty much where he has tried to erase history. He doesn't want you to know. That ancient Egypt was was uh, a so-called black, even though they're Hamites, they're not the same people as us. But they don't want you to know these things because they want to try to hide uh, the history of, of different nations around the earth to make themselves seem superior. But specifically, 
than uh, Jacob. They really don't want Jacob to know that he was anything more than, you know, niggas and spicks, okay? And that's why they, they whitewashed the, the history, you know. They, and, uh, and, uh, a key period in which they did that was through Roman iconoclasm. You know, they were quote-unquote whitewashing the images, the dark images of the saints and yep. whatnot, you know, try to uh, rewrite history. Right, you know? right, yep. Continuing on, it says... Uh, another point. Oh, yeah. Shot, uh, to line back what you were you're bringing out on the, you know, the... Uh, you know how, you know uh, the the word more is associated with the so-called Negro, right? The the word swarthy that you mentioned um, yeah. means dark skin, because the prefix of the word is swart is a Germ is in a Germanic language, and it means uh, uh and it means dark skin, all right. And you you right. can find that term you know in, in that book Nature Knows No Color Lines and so forth. Yep. You know that lines up with uh, what you bring out. I, I actually well. I actually just looked it up. Yes, um, right. I went into the word swarthy. It literally says an adjective. For dark skinned, dark or moreno. Yeah. Alright, so more once again the word uh, moreno comes from more. Yeah. Alright, so continuing on, all right, here it says in European art, Moors are also often shown with African features, pitch black, frizzled hair, flat and wide face, flat nosed and thick lips. The Drake Jewel, a rare documented piece of jewel from the sixteenth century, seemed to show a profile of a black king dominating the profile of a white woman okay so just to add on to this right quick i'm gonna go there's actually um let me show this right quick this is called a blackamore it was a piece of of jewelry okay that they used to wear in um in in, in ancient royal or not ancient but uh royal royal cultures of what's known as today as england so <clears throat> right here so i pull i got it pulled up if your brothers can you can look at it on my phone if you like a blackamoor, it says a blackamoor is a type of figure and visual trope in European decorative art typically found in works from the mo from the early modern period depicting a man of sub-Saharan African descent, usually in clothing that suggests high status. Why would they call it a blackamoor? Because the Moors were so-called black people. Now, if you look at these images, that's exactly what, what we see. Okay, so you can see, you know, so-called so -called, uh, Negroes. Mm -hmm. Okay, in in jewel, in, you know, in dressed in, in a uh, ritzy, expensive clothing, and you know, nice jewelry and all that kind of stuff, and this was seen as a status symbol to wear this kind of jewelry. All right, so because they knew that once again the 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 Moors, all right, that ruled over Europe for that 700 year period were so called uh, Negroes. All right, but this is information that they try to hide. You have to go deep into uh, history books and all that to find this information. But continuing on. Okay, it says, moreover, Moors were known to have contributed in areas of mathematics, astronomy, art, cuisine, medicine, and agriculture that helped develop Europe and bring them from the Dark Ages into the Renaissance. All right, so, I'm, actually, I'm going to read this last paragraph. It says, generations of Spanish rulers have allegedly tried to abolish this era from the historical record, but recent archaeology determined that Moors indeed ruled in Al-Andalus for more than 700 years. Okay, for, from 711 A.D. to 1492, which is about the time when the, the not too long before the Renaissance period pretty much came and the, the beast, all right, the, uh, the the red dragon had received its power back. Are you still in Romans, the, um, I'm not Romans, uh, Revelation 20? Yep. Okay, read that Revelation 20 where it says that uh, after the thousand years that the, the beast would be loosed back out to go and deceive the nations. This is uh, Revelation 22. It says, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bowed him a thousand years. Right. Now now read the part where it says that the dragon was loosed. It's probably about verse 7. All right. Let me check real fast. Yep, it is verse 7. Okay. Yep. Um, I guess I just skipped down to verse 7 then. Yeah. Uh, uh, Revelation 27 says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Right. So when a thousand years are expired, Satan <laughs> shall be loosed out of his prison. What is that talking about? That's talking about the, the Renaissance period, okay? After that, a thousand years where the Western Roman Empire had fell, all right, as we read, you had people known of as the Moors and, all, and also Israelites even before that that had taken over that, that, uh, that time period, okay? But when the, when the Western Roman Empire fell, you had something called the Byzantine Empire rise up, all right? And once again, these were Israelites. So that, that the area of what's known today as Europe was ruled over, okay, by so-called Negroes for significant portions of time, uh, during the Dark Ages, all right? Now, this is important history to know because, once again, we just thought it'd be, it'd be beautiful to bring out that a lot of these different, uh, when you think of fantasy and pop culture, 
different Disney movies and stuff like that. Um, you know, even the movie Shrek. All right, that's that's based in medieval times, so to speak. Okay, that all that architecture and the cool castles and all those things were ruled, uh, were ruled over and created a lot of times by Moors, so-called Negroes, which their main area that they ruled over was the Iberian Peninsula, which today is known of as Spain and Portugal. Okay, so that's the reason why uh, Southern Europeans, a lot of times they have dark skin, brown hair, all right, because they're really mixed, you know, so to speak, so-called mixed with, with uh, so-called Negro blood. A lot of them actually descend from the Israelites, okay, a lot of Italians, Spaniards, Portuguese, all right, Southern Europeans, a lot of them are darker because of this time period. Because whenever a nation comes in and rules over another, uh, they always, you know, mix in with the people. All right. Now, let's go ahead and get another article. We're going to go here. This one is from the uh, National Geographic. All right. So it says, history and culture. Who were the Moors? All right. Now, oh, it's making me put in an email when doing that before. Whatever. Let's I'll go ahead and put one in real quick. So we can access. I don't know why it's trying to make me put one in now. Oh, you know what? I forgot I have this in a different. Uh, let's see. I got it already pulled up right here. Boom. Okay. Who were the Moors? It says, <clears throat> if the term seems familiar from art and literature, but still confusing, there's a good reason. All right. And here it shows you an image of a so-called Moor. All right. Which once again, these were just Israelites. Okay. This looks like any other, you know, so-called Negro uh, walking around in America. Okay, but this is an image of a moor. All right, now, I'm going to go down, and it's going to tell you. It says, if the term moor seems familiar but confusing, there's a reason. Though the term can be found throughout literature, art, and history books, it does not actually describe a specific ethnicity or race. Instead, the concept of moors has been used to describe alternatively the reign of Muslims in Spain, Europeans of African descent, and others for centuries. All right, but once again, I'm telling you that the moors were so-called Negroes. Even when you go into the, uh, the online etymology dictionary, let me pull that up right quick. Okay, for the word more, it tells you the second set right here, the definition, it says, also applied to the Arabic conquerors of Spain, being a dark people in relation to Europeans, their name in the Middle Ages was a synonym for Negro, all right, because they were Negroes. Okay, but you, you had brought up the history, Brother Rayab, earlier that uh, that during the time of the Byzantine Empire, that the Crusaders, they had went to war against Muslim forces, and they lost, and they were converted to Islam. That's the reason why a lot of the Israelites, they were, you know, they were, they were uh, Muslim at the time, and they were going by the name of Moors. Mm -hmm. But Moors is synonymous with Negro or dark-skinned. Okay, we brought that out in the online etymology dictionary. And then we looked it up, you know, right. on Google, the new Oxford American Dictionary, et cetera, et cetera. All right, but let's go back to the article. Okay, so, uh, anyways, continuing on, it says, derived from the Latin word Morris, the term was originally used to describe Berbers and ethnic groups from the ancient Roman province of Mauritania. Over time, it was increasingly applied to Muslims living in Europe. Beginning the Renaissance, Moor and Blackamoor were also used to describe any person with dark skin. And we looked up what the Blackamoor figurines were, okay? They were, they were so-called Negroes depicted in royal and high-status positions, all right? And they were a, a status symbol for people to wear. Even today's time, you had a, um, actually a woman, I forgot her name, but she was reprimanded for wearing uh, a Blackamoor piece of jewelry. Uh, and if I can pull that up right quick. Okay. She was reprimanded for wearing a black and more piece of jewelry uh, over in, in London. She was, a, 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 you know, one of the royal family. Um, I'll type in black and more Meghan Markle, see if it'll come up. Because this happened recently. All right, and she wore a piece of jewelry. Okay, here it is. Princess Michael of Kent. All right, let's look it up. Okay. So this happened recently. Princess Michael of Kent, black and more. She got... You know, the, the media was pissed off about it. Probably not even because it's, they said it's so-called racist jewelry, but the reason why is because it depicts so-called Negroes are right, in a... In authoritative. In authoritative, right, exactly, right, right. right. So that's offensive because Esau has been trying to hide that history for a long time, but it's coming up, so... See, Prince, Prince Michael. Princess of Michael of Kent. Mm -hmm. And see, look at this, brothers. All right, you see, mm -hmm. 
this is this is the piece that she was wearing, mm -hmm. and you can see it has a so-called Negro with the crown. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. so this is called a Blackamoor uh, piece of jewelry. Okay, mm -hmm. you can see here's another one, but she got she got a lot of people were angry with her for wearing this, mm -hmm. but that once again, you know, the reason why they're really angry is because she's exposing a part of history that they're trying to cover up. All right, so let's go back to the National Geographic website, and we're gonna continue reading. All right, it says in, in AD 711, a group of North African Muslims led by the Berber general Tariq Ibn Zayyad captured the Iberian Peninsula, modern Spain and Portugal, known as Al Andulus. The territory became a prosperous cultural and economic center where education and the arts and sciences flourished. And once again, this was all under the Moors. <clears throat> These were Israelites that had been rebranded. All right, as, as uh, Arabs and Moors, mm -hmm. okay? But it says, over time, the strength of the Muslim state diminished, creating inroads for Christians who, re who resented Moorish rule. And we, it's probably Edomites. For centuries, Christian groups challenged Muslim territorial dominance in Al-Andulis and slowly expanded their territory. This culminated in 1492, when Catholic monarchs Ferdinand II and Isabella I won the Granada War and completed Spain's conquest of the Iberian Peninsula Eventually, the Moors were expelled from Spain. And ironically, okay, ironically, this was also around the time when they started, uh, not too long before they started sending slaves over to America, because a lot of people don't know this, but uh, they weren't just grabbing slaves off of the west coast of Africa. They were also grabbing slaves off of northwest Africa and from Spain and Portugal. And these were the Moors. These were the Israelites that in the prophecies, if a brother could, give me Joel chapter 3 and verse 6. In the prophecies, it tells you that tells you that um, that the children of Israel were sold into the Grecians. Okay, her brother could get that. So this is in the prophecies as well. So they said that they expelled them from Spain. Okay, and these were Moors, which were the tribe. They're really uh, the tribe of Judah, but they they had been conquered by by uh, by the Arabs, and they were worshiping their false Arab gods of Islam. All right. So if brother could give me Joel three and six. This is uh, Joel chapter three and verse six. And it reads, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. Right. Okay. So the children of Judah, the children of Jerusalem, all right, they were sold into the Grecians. Who, who are the Grecians today? That's the modern day so-called white man. Okay. We say so-called because he's not really white. He's red. All right. Going back to Esau. Okay. But they were the ones who had taken over that land of what's known as today. As, as Greece, all right, Javan, okay, so they were expelled from Spain, and they were sold into slavery right along with the Israelite brothers that were over on the west coast of Africa, all right, now, right here, we see a picture of some Moorish architecture in Spain, and once again, this looks very similar to the castles and stuff that you see in these different uh, medieval, um, these different medieval movies, okay, medieval timeline-based movies, Okay, once again, further further showing that a lot of these castles and the, the beautiful architecture that is considered a classic, you know, classic of Europe was actually created by so-called Negroes. All right. Now, oh, excuse me. Let's uh, see if there's any more in this article. Okay, it says, by then the idea of Moors had spread across Western Europe. Moor came to mean anyone who was Muslim or had dark skin, especially Europeans, would distinguish between black Moors and white Moors. All right, now, let's see. Speaking of okay. words, I had a, can you look up um, the Sardinia the Sardinia flag? Yeah. And then go to Wikipedia, and that first line will just explain everything, because what we're bringing out is secular history filled with biblical prophecy to, to further confirm who's ruling during the time of the the construction of those those uh, ancient royal buildings known as castles and whatnot. Right, right. All right. So you can see there the brother pulled it up. That's the Sardinia flag. If you could, if you can go to uh, Wikipedia, yep. you can read like the first line. Flag of Sardinia. Yep. Okay. It says the flag of Sardinia, also referred to as the Four Moors. Right there. Boom. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You keep reading. It represents and symbolizes the island of Sardinia in Italy and its people. It was also the historical flag and coats of arms of the Aragonese, then Spanish, and later Savoyard Kingdom of Sardinia. That's pretty much the point. Yep. So why is the flag of Sardinia consisting of four so-called black men? Or why does the, the, the flag of Sardinia have four so-called black men on it, otherwise known as uh, Moors? Right. Because those are Israelites. Right. 
All right. Yep. Those are the people that were ruling during the time of the construction of those 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 uh, royal you know uh, buildings, you know, those castles, and whatnot that we're going into, just to further showcase how royal the children of Israel are. Right. So you, it's, it's funny because, you know, Edomites always like to make fun. They say, we was kings and all right, that. Right, right. Well, we, we, we actually were. We actually were, right. <laughs> like we we, we right. literally right. were kings. Right. And, and they do it in a condescending, mocking fashion. Right. In our tone. But this is actually true. This is, this is secular history bringing out. And this that, this this flag for their, uh, uh, confirms that. Right. Yeah, they, they, they tried to hide. Right. Okay. Now, with that being said, we're going to move to the second part of the video. Okay, we got the history. Actually, you know what? I'm so lucky. How could I forget? I got some images of different castles that were created during this time when the Moors had ruled over in that area. Okay, so this one is called the Warwick Castle. All right, just gonna look at some images of it. Very, very beautiful architecture. Now, like I said, we can't 100% say who created it, but it's not far-fetched to believe that it was created by those Israelites that were ruling over what's known of today as Western Europe during this time. All right, so you can see very, very beautiful architecture. So this is the, World War, the uh, Warwick Castle created in 965 AD, which is right in the middle of the Moorish rule of Western Europe that was headquartered out of Spain and Portugal, known of also as the Iberian Peninsula. So you got some beautiful imagery right here. So a lot of times when you see these kind of pictures, you know, you think of once again, medieval, you know, uh, kings and castles, you know, the knight in the shining armor. That was all Jake. All right, that was all Israelites. Okay, that, that had ushered that time period in. All right, and they call it the Dark Ages because, you know, I mean, really because they weren't in power at that time, but also you could say dark people were ruling. Right. All right, but these, these, you know, these are very beautiful castles. I just, you know, we had we had this thought. We were, I don't know where it came from, but hey, the Wadi Habashmi Al Shai, he gave us the ideal to, to do this lesson. Right. All right, so you can see this is the Warwick Castle. I'm going to show you two more, and then we're going to go into some prophecy. All right, so now the next one I'm going to show you is the Edinburgh Castle. All right, and that one's very beautiful as well. And this one was created in 1103 A.D. All right, also created during the time when the Moors were ruling over uh, Europe at that, at that time. Now, that being said, <clears throat> let's see. Yep, so you can just see these pictures. Oh, wow, wow. Hey, check this out, brother. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Outside of the Edinburgh Castle. Look at this statue. See that? God. It looks like so-called Negroes mm, on God. the statue. Mm. Right. So this is this is all they try to hide this history. Mm. They kind of look like right. angels. Like, yep. like, mm -hmm. like, like one of them's uh, 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 uh releasing like a bow. Yeah. Yep. Spiritual. Yeah, but this is all once again, you know, this is all Jake. And we mm -hmm. see this stuff in movies, you know, mm -hmm. like when you were a kid, you imagined castles and dragons and all that kind of stuff. All that was Jake, man. Right. And it's beautiful. Uh, let's get this last one and then we'll move on to some prophecy. You should expand on that point because when you, when you think of Esau's um, infrastructure, you know, it's based off of the infrastructure of, of Petra. Yeah, Mount Petra. Yep. You know, like like uh, the White House or whatnot. Right. You know, so that, that's their architecture. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yep. This is this is most this is my favorite one right here. The yeah. Windsor Castle. Mm -hmm. All right. That is beautiful. Look at that. That's, that's fire, man. And our kingdom is going to be a million times better than this. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we're just showing you this is the creativity, you know, of, of Jake. Because once again, we showed you Jake was ruling during that time period, but they were calling themselves Moors. Mm -hmm. All right. And we say Jake, we're talking about Jacob, the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay, specifically the southern kingdom, the so-called Negroes. Right. All right. Now, we're going to go into uh, prophecy, okay, because the kingdom of heaven is going to be very beautiful. I think what sparked this whole... Uh, lesson is that I was I was thinking about how how beautiful the kingdom of heaven would be and that it would be like a dream So if a brother could get me um, uh, Psalms 126 All right, and we'll start from the top Okay, the kingdom of heaven is gonna be like a dream like how when you were a kid you dreamed of, of castles and dragons and Knights in shining armor, you know pulling up on the on the white horse and all that kind of stuff All right. Well, we lived that okay. J Jacob was the one who, who brought all those things Okay, as, as, you know, as we read, they ruled over Europe during that time period when those things were prevalent. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start off with this. Psalms 126, brother, start from the top, verse 1. Psalms 126 and 1. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Okay, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. So you think of your wildest dreams when you were a child. The kingdom of heaven is going to be even better than that, man. Okay. 
A million times better than that. All right, keep reading. Two. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord have done great things for them. That's right. Get verse three. Just keep read it all the way through. Okay. Three. The Lord have done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Four. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Yep. Five. That the that they sow in tears shall reap in joy. Yeah, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Six. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precautious seed. Precious. Oh, yes, right. Bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. All right. Yep. So, so this this whole this chapter is one of my favorite chapters, mm -hmm. Psalms 126. Pretty much going into how, you know, when 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 our captivity is turned, okay, it's going to be like a dream. All right. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that that made me think of how, you know, we we dream about uh, when we were kids, we dreamt about all these different things. You know, about um, you know, all, all of our wildness, wildest imaginations. Mm -hmm. And for me, I was always interested in the kings and castles and all that. Well, now we look into the history and we know that it was actually Jacob who was the one that was bringing that era of, uh, of society on. Now, Brother, um, Brother Rayab, get uh, Psalm 16 and 11. All right. Uh, Psalm 16 Hello. and 11. I'm pulling it up. Everything you read, I'm pulling up on the screen. Okay. Okay, all right. You can go ahead and bring it out. Yep, it says uh, Psalm 16 and 11. Thou will shew me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Right. Okay. So he says, thou will show me the path of life. All right. This, uh, entering into this kingdom okay, that we're looking forward to entering to, it starts off with this truth. This is the pathway of life. All right. In thy presence, when Yahawashai comes, okay, we just read it. It's gonna, when he turns our captivity, it's going to be like a dream. In thy presence is full of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So, you know, all we, we, can, we can sit and dream about. You know all of the um, all the things that we're going to receive in the kingdom, but it, it can't it can't even measure up. Our mind can't even fathom how beautiful the kingdom is going to be. All right, and and we look back at at the the um, creativity of Jake. You know, building those those castles and all those things. It doesn't even compare to what the kingdom of heaven is really going to be like, man. So it's just something to look forward to. Go ahead and get uh, Jeremiah thirty three. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jeremiah thirty three. No, verse nine. Okay. Mm -hmm. I right, hang on one sec. Okay, go ahead and get it. Jeremiah 33 and 9. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. That's right. Okay. So the Lord said, I'm going to bless the children of Israel, the so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native American Indians so much that the other nations are going to fear and tremble for all the goodness and prosperity that I give unto them. All right, that's that's beautiful right there. Okay, so like I said, just to keep further reiterating that point, all right, that we can't even fathom, okay, what the Lord is getting ready to do for the children of Israel. All right, if you could get Jeremiah 10 and 16, Brother Rayab. Let, uh, let me know when you got it. Yep, I got it. All right, bring it out. All right, it says, uh, Jeremiah 10 and 16, the portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord Yahweh of hosts is his name. Okay, right. So the portion of Jacob is not like them. All right, the, the elect, okay, the former of all things. Jacob was once a, a mighty and, and wonderful people. We, we're still royalty, even though we you know we don't see it. Okay, Jacob was, was created to be okay, the Lord's chosen people, man, above all the nations on the face of the earth. And once again, you know, our creativity shows that even in the face of adversity all right jacob jake has always been um what i'm looking for jake has always been you know the star so to speak all right and and i'm just going to read a quick uh, excerpt and if you could brother give me tobit 13. okay this is uh first kings the 10th chapter okay we're going to read about king solomon all right king solomon the queen of sheba came to visit him and she was at awe of how beautiful his kingdom was arrayed okay so much so that she even fainted Matter of fact, I'm going to I'm going to get it in uh no, you know, I I'll, I'll read in the KJV. So this is uh 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 1. It says, "And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with the with hard questions." So she didn't believe it. 
she didn't believe how good, you know, she heard of his, his glory, but she didn't, she didn't really believe it. So she came to, to test it. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. <clears throat> Verse 3, And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had, had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendants of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no spirit in her. Okay, so she fainted at how beautiful his kingdom was. Okay, I'm going to get this in another translation. Uh, 1 Kings 10 and 5. She was overwhelmed. She was, excuse me, 1 Kings 10 and 5 in the NLT. She was overwhelmed. She was also amazed at the food on his tables, the organization of his officials, and their splendid clothing, the cup bearers, and the burnt offerings Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. Okay, so she was, pretty much she was overwhelmed. There was, it says in ESV, the, uh, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cup bearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. So she literally fainted at how beautiful King Solomon's kingdom was, okay? And, and, and I, our kingdom is going to be even, even greater than that. How righteous are we be at that number that makes it? All right, continuing on. It says, verse 6, 1 Kings 10 and 6, And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believe not the words until I came and mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and thy prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. So she said, I heard all these wonderful things about you. I didn't believe it, and it wasn't even half of how great your kingdom is. Okay, and this is the queen of Sheba. All right, this is not this is not just some, you know, random person. It's not just, you know, anybody. Okay, this is also someone who was very powerful at that time. Right. It says, "Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom." Mm -hmm. Brother could give me Proverbs 29. I think 29 and 2. Okay, when it says the wicked beareth when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. You got that scripture? Okay, uh, I'm gonna bring that out. Proverbs 29 and 2 says, "When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice." Right. So First Kings 10 and 8, right? She said, happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee. So that's how you know that King Solomon, that the kingdom was just that glorious, right. where even servants were happy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right? When the righteous and authority, the people rejoice. Right. But guess what? What's the, what's the next, rest of that? It says, but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Right, so that's why everybody mourning right now, because mm -hmm. the wicked is in rulership. Mm -hmm. Okay? You know, every, nobody, nobody's happy in this society. Everybody's mourning. They're complaining about... Everything, all right, but but King, you know Solomon, he was such a righteous, you know, king that he even he even made his servants look like kings, right. all right. Okay, so continuing on, First Kings ten and nine. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made thee king to do judgment and justice, all right. And ironically, uh, uh, Solomon is Yahweh Shai, right. mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you know, in, in the reincarnation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue on reading in the NLT for the rest of it. A little bit easier to understand because it can get a little complicated. Um, so, 1 Kings 10 and verse uh, 10, NLT, it says, Then she gave the king a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold, great quantities of spices, and precious jewels. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. 9,000 pounds of gold. In addition... Hiram ships brought gold from Ophir, and they also brought rich, rich cargoes of red sandalwood and precious jewels. The king used the sandalwood to make railings for the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and to construct lyres and harps for the musicians. Never before or since has there been such a supply of sandalwood. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba whatever she asked for besides all the customary gifts he had so generously given. Then she and all her attendants returned to their own land. Okay, now this last part is only a few scriptures here. We'll go ahead and read it. It's entitled, Solomon's Wealth and Splendor. Each year, Solomon received about 25 tons of gold, thus did not include the additional revenue he received from merchants and traders, all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the land. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold, each weighing more than 15 pounds. 
He also made 300 smaller shields of hammered gold, each weighing nearly four pounds. The king placed these shields in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. The, then the king made a huge throne, decorated with ivy and overlaid with fine gold. See, that's Jake all the way. Just like when you, when you look at those castles, you look at the interiors of them. All right, I'm talking about extra luxurious, man. Because Jake always goes all out. Even, even in our lowest state, we, we got to give it to him. All right, Jake is always decked out. So much so that the rich, these, these Edomites that got all the money, they try to copy our style, our swag. Because that's just Jake right there for you, man. Go back to Jeremiah 10 and 16. Now, Jacob was a former of all things. We're the true innovators. Right. You know, and that's why even to this day, like, you know, it says Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, there's nothing new in the sun. Now, Jake, you know, likes, you know, uh, looking luxurious now, you know, even wearing uh, uh, um, lower quality gold, you know. Right. You know, you know, you know, you, know, you, see, you see Jake wearing uh, gold now. You know, we right. had that one nigga, uh, Trinidad James. Came out that song, Gold All Everywhere, gold. or something yep. like that. All gold in my teeth. Right, right, right. right. Hey, well, Jake. King Solomon said he had a row of, a row of gold in his cheeks. What was that, Ezekiel? That's um, um, Song of Solomon, actually. Kind of, kind of. Yeah, so King, even King Solomon had a, you know, he had gold grill. Kind of, yep. Right, yeah, he, had, he had gold teeth. So, you know, that's Jake is luxurious like that. Yeah, he said cheeks full of gold. Yep, exactly, yep. Song of Solomon. Yeah. But um, continuing on, it says, 1 Kings 10 and 19, the throne, you want to go ahead and bring that up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm going yeah, to get that. Psalm 1 and 10. Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. Right. Thy cheeks are comely, okay, with rows of gold. All right? That's talking about his teeth. God. So, you know, ain't no Edomite. Don't Edomites don't wear no gold teeth, man. That's, mm -hmm. that's Jacob all the way. All right? You go to Atlanta, Georgia, we <laughs> from, that's all you're going to see. You know, niggas going to smile. They got, right, right, <laughs> they right, got right. golds in their mouth. Right. Yeah. That's because that, we are the sons of Yasharala, man. Mm -hmm. All right? So we lavish like that, okay? But once again, it's just beautiful. You you study this history, seeing that wow, these castles, you know, could very well possibly have been made by by Israelites, man, by our people. And they and then they, that's the reason. Why, and they notice they notice history. That's why the reason why they tell you, they try to uh, make sure that you know each and every day that you're nothing, because they know that really you are. They, like I said, they make fun of we was kings and all that. No, we we really were kings, literally. And we're gonna return to that state. All right, mm -hmm. but continuing on, First Kings, all right, ten and verse nineteen. The throne had six steps and a rounded back. There were armrests on both sides of the seat, and the figure of a lion stood on each side of the throne. That's Jake all day uh -huh. putting lions. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? A lion on each side. That's, that's Jake all day. Like a coming to America. You know? Yep, yep. There were also twelve other lions, one standing on each end of the six steps. No other throne in all the world could be compared with it. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were solid gold, as were all the utensils in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. They were not made of silver, for silver was considered worthless in Solomon's day. That tells you how, how mm. splendid it was, man. He said, I, we, silver's not even, we're not even, it's not even worthy, you know, silver's not even worthy to be eaten off of. All right, we need, we need all gold cups, forks, spoons, all right? It says, um, the, the king had a, fleeting, a fleet of trading ships that sailed with Hiram's fleet. Once every three years, the ships returned, loaded with gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. And we talked about that, about how um, the northern kingdom, they knew, the northern kingdom of the Israelites, the so-called indigenous of the Americas, they knew about uh, Arsareth, all right, because King Solomon, he was sending ships back and forth because the journey on a boat is, a, is one and a half years to go there and one and a half years to come back. Mm -hmm. all right, we brought that out at that, um, that uh, the Decalogue stone, right, yep. So it says, so King Solomon became richer and wiser than any other king on earth. People from every nation came to consult him and to hear the wisdom that the Most High had given him. Year after year, everyone who, who visited brought him gifts of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. All right, it says, Solomon built up a huge force of chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stationed some of them in the chariot cities and some near him in Jerusalem. The king made silver as plenty in Jerusalem as stone, and value, valuable cedar timber, wood, was as common as the sycamore fig trees that grow in the foothills of Judah. Okay, so you can see we don't have to go any farther. Right. All right, this guy, that he, he, everything was in splendor. Okay, and once again, that was just a taste mm -hmm. of what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. Okay, um, brother, uh, could you get Tobit the 13th chapter? Uh, this is Tobit. Oh, let me let me see uh, real quick. Oh, yeah, I got I got to pull it up. Now you good? You good? I got to pull it up. Um, Tobit chapter thirteen and sixteen. Yep, that's it. Okay. Yep. Uh, go go ahead and go ahead and start at um. 
Go ahead and start at 15. God, this is told it, chapter 13 and verse 15. And it says, Let my soul bless the Most High, Yahweh, the great King. Verse 16. For Jerusalem shall be built up with sapphires and emeralds and precious stone, thy walls and towers and battlements with pure gold. And the streets of Jerusalem, verse 17, and the streets of Jerusalem shall be paved with beryl and carbuncle and stones of Ophir. And I would say in uh, Isaiah 13, that I have the Father would make uh, the men more precious than fine gold. Talking about the elect. Yep, then the right? golden wedge of Ophir. Kind of, kind of. Yep. Because yeah, that's that's a, the finest, you know, the, uh, you know, the finest quality gold. Right. All right. Just further confirms how luxurious, you know, Jake is. You yep. Know, is, you know, so, verse 18 says, And all her streets shall say, Hallelujah, and they shall praise him, saying, Blessed be the Most High, Yahweh, which hath extolled it forever. That's right. Verse 6. All right. So, so this is just a prophecy, okay, of, of what, you know, what the kingdom is going to be like. It's going to be on the earth. All right, when, the, when these nations are in captivity rebuilding the earth, all right, they're going to be rebuilding our cities with, with fine gold, okay, with sapphires, emeralds, precious stones. All right, I think it tells you that in Revelation 20, first chapter as well, it lists off the different types of, um, it lists off the different types of stones and stuff that are going to be used in the kingdom. But anyways, um, we'll move, we'll move on. If you can find it, that's great. If not, don't worry about it. Um, but brother, I now get Isaiah chapter 11, okay. And uh, hold, 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 one sec, one sec, six. one second. Hang on, I gotta pull it up. Hang on, one sec. All right, Isaiah, go ahead and bring it out. Isaiah eleven and six. You can start from there. All right. He's gotta wait till I pull it up on the phone. Oh yes, sir. All right, Isaiah eleven and six. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Right. So in in the kingdom of heaven, okay which is going to be on the earth, the Lord is going to put the spirit on animals to be at peace, all right? Even so much so, all right, that it said a wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with a kid, that's a goat, all right, a, a baby goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them, okay? So in our kingdom, you're going to, you know, it's going to, it's going to be not only glorious, you're going to have precious uh, jewels and, and gold, sapphires, rubies and all those kind of things, you know, uh, uh, all over Jerusalem, and then, of course, probably in even other cities around the world, all right, but the animals that be at peace with each other, all right, and that's that's beautiful, okay, go ahead and get the next verse, verse 7, mm -hmm. verse 7, no, I got it, <clears throat> verse 7, and the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw, like the ox. Right, so the animals will be at peace with each other. Ain't gonna, there's no, not going to be any danger in, in, the, in the earth anymore, except for if, if a heathen nation wants to get out of line. That's the only danger it's going to be. But for the Israelites, it's not going to be death, sorrow, mourning, any of these things, man. Okay? A beautiful kingdom beyond what you could even imagine. All right, go ahead and get the next verse, verse 8. Mm -hmm. Verse 8. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the winged child shall put his hand on the copter's den. Right, so suckling child is talking about a, uh, even a baby that, that drinks breast milk will be able to play in a snake hole and not have to worry about getting bitten, okay? A weaned child, which a child that's been weaned, I mean, he's, he's now, he's off of the titty. He Maybe you know, a toddler, three, four years old. He'll be able to play with snakes and not have to worry about getting bitten because that's the spirit of the Lord is going to be so heavy on earth. Everything's going to be in perfect harmony, okay? Go ahead and get verse 9. Verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy... In all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's right. Beautiful. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll, um, if if you got you got the revelation. Uh, yeah, Twenty one. Go ahead. Go ahead and bring it out. Yeah, we'll start at verse two for context. I just like verse one. It says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, as Esau Edom's ruby shoot. It says in Second Peter the third chapter. And just just hold on one second. What's what scripture are you getting? Uh, revelation. 21 and 1. Okay. So, like, yeah, I, had to, I got to pull it up. Okay. Boom. Ah, oh, you can start. I got okay. it. Okay. Revelation 21 and 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. We know new in the Greek is kainos, meaning refreshed. 
So talking about a new rulership, as in Jacob's rulership, the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites. Right, right. So verse 2 says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from the Most High, Yahweh, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. All right? That bride is Israel. All right? And the husband is uh, Abba, Yahweh, Yahweh, our father, Yahweh. Jump down to verse 10. It says, And he carried me away in, in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and shewed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from the Most High Yahweh, having the glory of the Most High Yahweh, and her light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a great wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Yep says on verse 13, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Verse yep. 13. And you probably could stop there. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, skip down. This is the part I really want. Yeah. Skip down to um, verse uh, 18. Uh, Revelation 21 and 18 says, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz. The tenth, a chrysoprasis, 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 I think, Chry something like that. Yeah, yeah. chrysoprasis, yeah, 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 yeah. chrysoprasis. The eleventh, a jacinth, the twelfth, an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Right, that's beautiful. God. That's beautiful, and <laughs> I mean, hey, we don't, we don't have to, we don't have to read anymore. Right. All right, so you see. All right, once again, straight, straight luxury, okay? Right. But, you know, um, King Solomon's rule, that was just a, a small taste of what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like for the children of Israel. And then, like, you see, even going back, you look back to, like I said, you know, uh, the medieval times and the great architecture that, that Jake was was uh, pushing out. All right, it just, it, it really hypes you up for what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like, man. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close out with this last scripture. Brother, I right now go ahead and bring out Isaiah 65. In verse 25, let me give me one second, I'm gonna pull it up. All right, just wanted to make a quick point. Yep, on uh, Re um, Revelation 21 and 14, where he spoke about you know uh, the 12 foundations in the name of the uh, in an, and, and in the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. You know, that's you know going into uh, that 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 lines with what um, uh, Yahweh Shai mentioned in St. Matthew 19 and 28, you know, about um, you know, the the elect of the nation of Israel. You know, judging the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, in other words, you know, this, you know, everything that we're bringing into, or we're going into, rather, is going into the to New Jerusalem, all right, the glorious kingdom of heaven, which is part of the, the reward, okay, of, uh, you know, the, the elect of the elect, you know what I'm saying, 144,000, you know, uh, uh, elect governing body of, of Israel, the house of David, all right, to rule in the, in the kingdom of heaven and to enjoy all of this glory that we're reading about. You know, you know that, and that includes our apostles and elders on down, because they have a great reward uh, waiting for them, all right, right. including the, the men that uh, were brought under their stead. Yep. Going to Hebrews 11 chapter. Yep. You know, so That's just it. want to on that real quick. That's it. Fire. Go ahead and bring out your precept, Lord. Isaiah 65 and 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. Yep. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Right. So just to further further reiterate that point, you know, even the animals will be at peace. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I actually have one more scripture I'm going to close out with. Okay. Wisdom of Solomon, the third chapter. All right. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter three. Let me see. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter three. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and. Actually, I'll get two two different verses. Wisdom Solomon three and Wisdom Solomon five. Wisdom Solomon three and verse um eight. They shall judge the nations and have dominion over the people, and their Lord shall reign forever. 
They that put their trust in him shall understand the truth, and such as be faithful in love shall abide with him, for grace and mercy is to his saints, and he hath care for his elect. Okay. So what 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 is what is he going to give his elect? A glorious kingdom. All right. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter five. <clears throat> Wisdom of Solomon chapter five and verse fifteen. It says, But the righteous live forevermore. The reward also is with the Lord, and the care of them is with the Most High. Therefore shall they receive a glorious kingdom and a beautiful crown from the Lord's hand, for with his right hand shall he cover them, and with his, his arm shall he protect them. Okay? So the main part is that they're going to receive a glorious kingdom and a beautiful crown from the Lord's hand. All right? So just want to bring that out. Okay? A little bit of history. Okay? We sh you know, showing you that, that uh, you know, how the creativity of Jake, all right, and how... You know, we uh they they had built even at that time, you know, beautiful castles and and built a culture that even in today's time is reverenced in pop culture and movies and you know with different Disney movies and all and, and kids movies they, they dream about this kind of stuff they dream about castles and dragons right. you know and that was the that was former glory right. okay the glory that that Jake is going to receive in the kingdom of heaven all right is a million times better all right than than what we could even fathom. As a matter of fact, I think it's Isaiah 64 and 4. We'll, we'll close out with that. All right. Boom, boom. This is it. It says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O Yahweh, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Okay. So, that you know, Lord's will, this was edifying, edifying you on know, some secular history and on some prophecy of the glory of the kingdom. All right, Yahweh Rachazah, it was exhorting, edifying, and comforting, God. okay? Because, you know, we have a lot to look forward to. God. So, we am close out with that. And as always, we're going to give our praise, our honor, and our glory unto Yahweh Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem Rakakwadash. And until next time, Shalom and abide Babal. Thank you.